Hello, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, the show about creatures, encounters, old tales, and myths. I'm your host, Iona Wayland, a dark fantasy author, mental health professional, and overall curious person. I want to join other spooky souls and hear about these unusual stories. Hello, spooky soul. I've been so eager to introduce you to fantasy lover, plus-sized quest fashionista, folklore explorer, and adventurous spirit, Heather Canfield. Welcome, (laughs) Heather. I'm so excited you're here. Thanks for speaking with me and the fellow spooky soul who's listening. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, Iona. Gosh, it is so exciting to be sitting down with you on your podcast. I'm a big creepy core and folklore fan, so this is a real honor. I'm a lifelong enthusiast of all things folklore, spooky, and fantasy, who recently moved 5,000 miles, 8,000 kilometers from Portland, Oregon to Limerick, Ireland. Incredible. I grew up, you know, <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finally getting the hang of kilometers, too. Oh, I don't understand <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I grew up hearing all the spooky and beautiful Irish folk tales from my Cork-born Irish granddad. Mm-hmm. He passed on when I was only 16, but researching Irish folklore is a way I feel close to him. I found so much interesting mythology, folklore, and ghost stories since I moved here that I recently started an Instagram and TikTok series to share what I'm learning. When I'm not pouring over folklore books or websites with a huge mug of tea, you might find me out exploring Ireland, making fashion content about dressing like a hobbit on a quest, <laughs> rewatching Avatar The Last Airbender, or baking something scrumptious. I love this. Oh my gosh, I've been so excited to talk with you. Yes, definitely um, to the spooky soul who's listening, check out all of uh, Heather Canfield's stuff. Her name, her handle is um, heather.wildflower and I'll make sure I include her information and we'll talk about it later in the show notes below but it's just really cool because the aesthetics and the greenery and like your journey it's very very neat and do you have do, you. do you have animals too no I do not <sighs> thought I saw dog dogs So one of the ways that I am exploring Ireland and Scotland is house sitting and pet sitting for people. That's so cool. Yeah, I don't have any home. Um, But probably what you saw is I spent a big chunk of April pet sitting four dogs at a castle in Ireland. And it was the dream. That's so cool. (laughs) That's exactly what I saw. Because you were doing the the challenge, like the running challenge, and you were like, I will bribe you. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> so cute. So I know I've been fascinated with this folkloric and thematic concept of the quote women in white and quote imagery. Um, I alluded back to it like in my second episode when I talked about La Llorona. And you have a lovely series on uh your TikTok and your Instagram reels called Heather's Hearth that I absolutely love. Um, and you've discussed quote the bishop's wife, which I had never heard of before. So tell us a bit more first about the concept of women in white, and we can discuss the symbolism behind it. Yes. Okay. So for me, the women in white legends were one of the first real patterns I noticed as a kid fascinated with ghost stories. I noticed a lot of hauntings involved like sounds and temperature changes, objects being moved, sometimes a shadow or indistinct figure showing Mm -hmm. up on film. Mm -hmm. But when seeing a clear, consistent visual of a ghostly human, like that's not very common. Mm -hmm. And so often when someone's describing a consistent human form, it's a young woman in a white dress. Yes, you're right. So for years, I've been like mentally collecting these stories and wondering why, like what is the link? Mm -hmm. These women in white stories circle the globe and many are ancient. Mm -hmm. These legends are so significant. They often end up preserved forever in language and place names, such as I'm going to try my best with all the different languages here, guys. (laughs) Bear with me. But Mm -hmm. there's um, Chute de la Dame Blanche, White Lady Waterfall and White Lady Lake in Canada. Wow. There's White Lady Rock in Namibia. Oh. There's White Lady Hotels in Scotland and Ireland, yeah. wow. Dom Blanche Caves in Normandy. Oh. 
And in Dutch, a saying for like all thick fog and mist is mm-hmm. wit women, which means white women. Yes. that Okay. So there's um, a Dutch person that is in like a, um, oh my gosh, Discord channel that I'm in. And way back when I was doing uh, researching Willow the Wisps and orbs and things like that, it's so weird because like orbs are considered like mostly like good entities depending on the color though and then uh will of the wisps are considered usually like tricksters but whenever i was talking with them about it they were talking about with uh i can't say it what was it with within i mean yes. i'm probably not pronouncing it right no either, that's it but... <laughs> it's like that with our american accents but yeah that's it so it's really cool that you brought that up because i was just talking with them about it like this morning so that's pretty cool and it's, it's in- incredible that, like, it's so common that there are even place names across the globe based off of them. That is crazy. I did not know that. Yeah, that's one of my my favorite aspects that I found. Of, like, it's just so old and ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. Okay, so something that's really interesting, in my opinion, is, like, the reference to, like, color theory um, and how it affects humans. So usually, like, white is connotated at least I think in the western world eh, I think it's across the globe too but like with purity and innocence and I thought that was really interesting that like usually there's this like sense of revenge when it comes to or like justice when it comes to uh the women in white I'm gonna say mm-hmm. white women at some point by accident <laughs> it's already ha- I'm already fighting it but um so whenever it comes to like women in white it's really interesting because there's like this purity uh aspect to it or this youthful aspect to it I just thought it was interesting that it was juxtaposed with like how they're uh decaying or how they're thin like like visually thin or um and by visually thin I mean like not as opaque like transparent looking but then the dress that they're dressed in is clearly white and a wispy white thing so I thought that was interesting um and the other thing is like on the flip side when you see in literature and stuff like that there'll be the femme fatale and they're always this like either dark haired and eyed and or dark dark skinned woman who like sub- seduces the virtuous man whatever that means but this is kind of like that where this woman will, will seduce a person into death or tricking them or what what have you and it's kind of flipped instead of it being a virtuous man it's usually like a gross guy that no one knows is gross and then the woman is like the reverse femme fatale and it's interesting that it's like flipped in that way where it's like the guy is kind of skeevy but the woman is virtuous And I don't know, but there's still seduction involved, not with not necessarily sexual can be, but with like luring into something. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting like thread. Um, And I just also think that it's unfortunate that there's like this connotation with it after death. But when like women are portrayed as like the damsel in distress, it's kind of like, actually, I'm independent now. And like they're off to their own devices. They're not linked mm-hmm. to something in some of the women in white stories. So I thought that was interesting. Yes, I'm totally with you. And I think a lot of those um, really interesting sort of like clashing elements of like the really pure and virtuous imagery of the white dress. A lot of times they're mm-hmm. specifically brides. Oh, yes. But then what kind of strikes me about that is wedding dresses like the craze of them across cultures being Mm -hmm. white Mm -hmm. didn't start until after Queen Victoria in the mid 19th century. I did. And a lot of these stories are much, much older than that. Like the Bishop's Bride in Limerick is way older than that. Yeah. Friend of Mm -hmm. women in white, meaning a bride. So it's like, if the apparitions show up this way, is that modern people being like, Oh, people only wear white when they get married (laughs) or like just kind of not really sure what is going on there and there's kind of an interesting disconnect of so many times they're described as like brides and veils and stuff but white wedding is only like mid 19th century on that's really interesting to know because I know the whole like white wedding thing is definitely linked with like purity culture and teachings Mm -hmm. and things like that um and at least from what I've 
scene um and that's like what it's supposed to symbolize i guess um if you Mm want to call whatever you want pure i guess i don't know sometimes (laughs) i have thoughts about it um but on the flip side if if we're talking about our physical world I was thinking like, oh, that's like almost like an unexpected or sudden death because maybe they are in a nightgown or something Mm -hmm. like that. Um, But also that's not even taking into account, like in my mind, the like, what are they? Because it's like, oh, are they white because they're a ghost or are they white because there's something that happens to spirits that are like, I don't know, vengeful or have unfinished business or something like that that kind of turns whatever they're wearing white I'm not sure it's very interesting there is a really interesting potential link that this paranormal Ireland book I've been reading talked about Mm. I highlighted the passage because I was like this is taking keeping into account of just like why white why across the world we have this image of like a woman in a white dress yes as a really common like visual ghost Mm -hmm. um so in this book an investigator named helen barrett says there are many instances of hauntings by white ladies across the world and particularly in ireland this is because the energy released at the time of death will often not sustain its color over time a person in the 16th century might have seen the ghost of a woman in a red shawl and a blue bonnet But if you saw her today, she might be a pale spirit, all white, perhaps, because the image has faded. A ghost is a mental energy which can fade just like a photograph can. Whoa. And I was like, so are they just really old? They could be, especially because it's like, oh, the spans, like the ages and stuff like that. Oh, that kind of creeps me out. I mean, I guess that's the point. But like, it's like, (laughs) they're so old. Like that's, it's like they're fading. Like what happens after they fade, fade? I don't know. <laughs> so Yeah, crazy. like they can still show up, but they don't have any of like the color that they had. Yeah. That's yeah. so interesting. So that, that really stuck out to me because yeah, Ireland has a lot of them. So there's a lot of them in the Paranormal Ireland research book. <laughs> Very cool. I'll have the um, title and the um, author name in the show notes um but mm-hmm. look at heather coming here like super freaking prepared <laughs> she's got she's got notes she's got <laughs> research articles like she's here <laughs> yes i have i have like a rapid fire section of just ones from different parts of the world maybe we can go i into. would love to hear about them okay So rapid fire look at some of my favorite women in white legends that really show how worldwide this folklore trend is. Mm -hmm. Obviously the town I moved to in Ireland has one called the Bishop's Lady and Mm -hmm. we're going to get to her in detail later. Mm -hmm. Ireland has another famous ghost ride in Kinsale and on Bean Bon, Irish probably butchered it for white lady Mm -hmm. is a famous ghost in Dublin. There was also one near where I grew up in Texas called the White Lady of White Rock Lake. Oh. In that story, a woman in a dripping white formal dress tries to get into people's cars at White Rock <gasps> Lake. Oh. If you offer her a ride at some point in the drive, she will disappear, leaving only a puddle behind. Oh, no. <laughs> this is why we don't pick up hitchhikers. <laughs> <Yeah>. ghosts. <laughs> I also grew up hearing tales in Texas of La Llorona, who fits this type of legend. Mm-hmm. Yep. So in Brazil, they have Dama Branca, who is said to be wandering in a white sleeping gown, recounting the misfortunes that happened to her when she was alive. The misfortunes vary based on the telling, but common themes are adultery, forbidden love, or dying in childbirth. Interesting. The Yakshi ghost from Kerala, India, seduces and terrorizes men in death because in life she could not be with the man she truly desired. Oh, Germany has many famous white lady ghosts who often haunt castles. They're often associated with specific noble women who lived in the castle who were particularly unhappy or abused in their marriages. Mm -hmm. Malta has a white lady who haunts Verdala Palace. She -hmm. is said to have committed suicide in her wedding dress because she didn't want to marry someone she did not love. Uh She is said to be most commonly seen on the August full moon ball at this castle. Oh. 
yes, yeah, specific date, which also there's a famous Estonian white lady ghost who resides in Hapsalu Castle. And she is also supposed to be always seen on the full moon in August. That's so interesting about the August full moon shit. That's like, crazy. What? And like, why? Malta and Estonia are not that close together. No. <laughs> um. So her story, the Hapsalu Castle white lady is really similar to the Limerick Bishop's Bride one that I'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. In the Estonian tale, a young woman is having an affair with a priest. And when the Mm -hmm. bishop discovers their love affair, Mm -hmm. he buries the woman alive in the wall of the castle chapel as punishment. Oh my god. Like no, I was uh, like, honestly, if someone did that to me, I'd be I haunting also, the castle every single day. Not I would just full I would in be August. Like, this there is, would be no rest. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, wow, girl really like pulled herself back and is like very generous to only haunt like a couple days out of the month in August once a year. Like, come on, girl. Like you were buried alive. Like be vengeful. I'm fine with that. What and the, the legend hell? says nothing about any punishment for the priest I mean, that she was involved with, of course. I mean, I guess it's mind. a punishment to him that she was buried alive. I, I guess. I feel bad <laughs> like, about that. Oh, my God. It was so funny because in the back of my mind, I was like, of course he didn't get in trouble. He probably didn't get defrocked or anything. No. But then I was going to ask you about it. And then whenever you're like, oh, there was no mention of punishment, I was like, forget it. <laughs> I'm like, I already knew this would happen. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah. So in in the Philippines, ghosts of beautiful women in white with long hair are known as caparosa. Mm -hmm. There's lots of stories of them hitchhiking and hailing taxis. Interesting. There's even a famous Filipino horror film called The White Lady inspired by these tales. Oh. Namibia in Africa has a famous white lady ghost of Uniondale. There's a 2014 movie about this haunting that I might have to watch after this. Very cool. The the story goes that a couple had a tragic car crash on their honeymoon and were buried in different cities. The bride is trying to hitchhike back to her beloved and is also seen on the stretch of road near where she died, hailing cars in her wedding dress. Wow. I heard this tale when a lovely person named Maxie commented on my reel about the Bishop's Bride. Mm-hmm. And then when I Googled White Lady Ghost Namibia, I found the oldest piece of White Lady Ghost lore I've ever heard. Mm. Are you ready? I'm so prepared <laughs> for this. So there's a famous rock painting at Bramberg Mountain in Namibia that is estimated to be 2,000 years old. Wow. Okay. It features humans and animals rendered in earth tones. Mm -hmm. The rock art also shows two stark, chalky, supernaturally white figures. Mm. One is faint, but the other one has a lot of detail preserved and is definitely feminine. Wow. The chalky figures almost look to me like they're chasing the crowd of humans and animals. (gasps) Oh my gosh, I just got goosebumps. (laughs) (laughs) The oldest white lady haunting we know of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'd like to think so. Mm-hmm. I think so. Uh, that's really fascinating to me. I don't know. That's like there's still like it's it's been consistent this whole time. It's been consistent. That's crazy, and that doesn't happen. Like I mean, there will be certain themes if there are certain chunks of the world going through similar things, but this spans the globe, and it spans like like um territories like anytime there's mountains Mm -hmm. like not trying to mansplain this to you but like anytime there are these (laughs) big mountain ranges or like oceans usually the folklore and the language behind it changes a bit and then the culture is completely different usually so like the the themes that pop up in the folkloric tales will shift to represent like what's going on but the fact that this has been so old and across the globe despite everything else that's so consistent that's crazy yeah I really couldn't I was really grateful to Maxie for commenting that because I had never heard about the beautiful rock art of it but I just totally got chills when I was looking at it and it is just called white lady rock in English obviously Um, yeah go Maxie (laughs) thanks Maxie (laughs) that's awesome that's crazy to me just covered in goosebumps (laughs) yeah so there's 
tons of white lady ghost references in the USA and the United Kingdom as well. These were the easiest for me to research because I speak English, but mm-hmm. I really can't share all of them or I'm sure we'll run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Common themes besides wearing white include bodies of water, hitchhiking, deaths mm-hmm. of children, and adultery. Mm-hmm. Highly, highly recommend spending an afternoon on the white lady Wikipedia page next <laughs> time you feel like going down a ghostly rabbit hole. <laughs> You'll either find a bunch of ghosts or a bunch of Karens. There's no telling <laughs> which one. I'm just kidding. I'm just being a jerk. But I think that that's really cool that there's a whole like Wikipedia page and like other websites dedicated to like keeping track of all the different like stories. So Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool that you were able to find such a thing. Yeah. One, even just like if you speak any other language and you Google whatever a white woman is in that language, Mm -hmm. like Dom Blanche for French, Mm -hmm. you will find so much. It was really making me regret not being multilingual because I was like, how can I do this justice? Like how worldwide it is. It's crazy how it is. That's the thing. That's the best we can do is just (laughs) poorly pronounce the name. (laughs) Just try. Just Just, Google Translate. (laughs) Just have it all in like a Siri voice just explain each one I think that's completely valid <laughs> you were talking about I almost every like small town that somebody lives in there's some sort of ghost tale there and if we go off of that paranormal Ireland book it's possible that the longer that the ghosts are there they'll just end up becoming women in white basically so that's really interesting mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah, so I it's just I think part of what's had this be one of my favorite ghost stories my whole life is that just like why is there so many? Why is it such a popular folktale around the world? Like mm-hmm. what about the human psyche really likes this story of mm-hmm. a woman in a white dress getting her revenge? Mm-hmm. Um I think maybe if if I had to speculate wildly, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would say there's something really powerful about the women in white stories because mm-hmm. often the character didn't have a lot of agency in their life. Yep, They're like married off to someone they didn't like, betrayed by someone that loved them, losing custody of their children, mm-hmm. had a sudden tragic death, mm-hmm. forbidden to marry someone they loved. Mm-hmm. But in their ghostly forms, they do have power and mm-hmm. they make sure their stories are this like warning that's never forgotten. Yeah. And we, we probably like that and like retell them for that reason. Yeah, because it balances the scales of justice, so to speak, if I'm going to be real dramatic about this, it does. And mm-hmm. that's how I felt about like going back to the, my special episode 40, which I won't shut up about because it ended up being three episodes long. <laughs> um, that's similar. Like I came to like a similar speculation, like conclusion, I guess you could say, because it's like. There will there were these people that were queer or people of color or what have you that were not given the same rights. And so it's like they or had sudden tragic deaths or were even murdered. And then they could have their like justice as a mermaid. Like they were like reborn as a mermaid, basically. So I do think that's interesting because I didn't think about it before, but I do think that that's like part of why people tell those tales so much and that we we can like resonate with it is because there have been people that have felt like they don't have agency in their life before and they can really understand why like even from the beginning of this interview I was like I get why (laughs) like I get why this (laughs) is the thing Hello and thank you for listening. I am so excited to say that I now have a Patreon that you can go to. I'll make sure I include the information in the show notes. But I have multiple tiers you can choose from, $1, $3, and $5 tiers. The $1 Spooky Soul tier gives you access to an online Discord community that is filled with fellow Spooky Souls. If you want to talk about creepy, cozy things, you might be interested in that. The $2 Cryptid Creature tier lets you have that online community, as well as giving you early access to episodes bonus content and secret bonus content and the five dollar kachu cuddler tier named after my fluffy squish faced kitty lets you have that online community early access to episodes and the bonus material but it also lets you suggest future episodes and i'll shout out your name during each episode 
So I want to thank my Kachu cuddler, River Hemmins, for being a patron on Patreon. Thank you so much for your listenership and support. And I can't wait to talk to you more soon. So it's funny that you talk about uh, women in white, just like my last little thing about color theory because I won't shut up about color theory um so I know I've seen this kind of concept start to show up uh, a bit in different ways in recent creepy stories so this isn't like necessarily folklore this is like specifically horror fiction type of stuff in books um tv shows and like shorts and um uh video games so like there is this interesting way that yellow has started to show up in recent years, especially in like the indie horror game that I was playing. I was playing Little Nightmares and then I tried to play Fran Bow and both of them I was really scared and I'm I love video games very much, but I'm not very good at them. So I ended up watching playthroughs. But like the the symbolism of yellow pops up a lot. And to the spooky soul that's listening, um uh I'm sure like if you've watched uh Coraline before like the yellow jacket and stuff like that's very interesting but um it there was this neat uh YouTuber named Abbott Frank who talks about this in their video essay why yellow dominates the horror genre and I'll make sure to link the video in the show notes but I just wanted to throw out that tangential thing real quick about how color is like important in storytelling and how it can help the brain like kind of focus on certain things Something I remembered, I couldn't really figure out a place to put it in, but Mm -hmm. one of the theories for at least in the, like, Germany, Switzerland, France tellings of La Dame Blanche is that it is sort of a way of the stories of goddess lore surviving Christianity. (gasps) So it's like, she's not a goddess anymore, she's a ghost, but it's kind of like a a protective like land spirit yes thing that was one theory i saw for why these stories are so widespread of like it's sort of it has um, pagan roots and to survive like like the like missionary type stuff or like persecution of people who believe uh old gods and goddesses that's a way you can be like i'm not praying to a god or goddess this is i'm talking to a ghost so you're like ah yeah <laughs> yeah so that is one theory specifically for like the european swath of la dame blanche is that it is sort of like a protective goddess land spirit cool possibly possibly that's really neat it reminds me of i know it's not the same um at all because this one isn't possible like a possibly situation this one is like definitely what happened but um i did uh an episode for earth day and i really wanted to focus on pache mama because i had like such a mm-hmm. deep connection with that whenever i visited peru but there was like they they had to fit in different ways to like worship her without being caught by uh the spaniards that were colonizing so i thought it was really interesting to like if that's what happened more in that section of the world where that's how they were able to continue that would not surprise me at all Mm-hmm. very interesting yeah there's a welsh version of her which welsh is gorgeous but i'm not going to try to pronounce it you'll have to forgive <laughs> it's me. beautiful language um, i cannot wear my mouth the, work. yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> the woman in white it is and it just translates literally to that uh-huh. um does have more of like a deity influence mm. and like uh leads people to treasure and like does nice things so that That's kind of made me really think about cool. too of okay so maybe there's some versions of like a woman long hair white dress mm-hmm. not then ben- she likes the welsh <laughs> for some reason she likes the welsh <laughs> she will give the money and riches and <laughs> That's so cool. So if you see her, follow her. But everywhere else, be scared <laughs> if you're <laughs> a bad person. <laughs> oh my gosh. Whenever it comes to the women in white and imagery, you mentioned you were first really taking a deeper look into it when you moved to Ireland. Like I know you've been curious about it the whole time. And I love that this is like a leg- legacy for your grandfather. I didn't realize that. And I think that's like a beautiful way to remember him by getting into creeptastic stories. Um, and so uh, 
I know whenever you first moved to Ireland that you were struck by the Sawin parade. I remember when you posted that video too, it was very cool. Um, but you saw this entity depicted and you started down this rabbit hole. Tell us about what you learned and how this story resonated with you. Would love to. So when I was watching the first Samhain parade, I was really excited. I moved to Ireland in mid-October. That was like one of our goals in 2022 is we were here for Halloween Samhain in 2019. Yes. And then we were like, we will do whatever it takes to move by Halloween. That's so cool. This is like the birthplace of Halloween. And they just, they go really hard for Samhain. Like the Mm -hmm. kids get the whole week off school. It's amazing. That's very cool. I know. I was like, American kids would like, be so jealous. <laughs> school, <laughs> school off for Halloween. Like. Yep. <laughs> um, so when I was watching the sound parade, the central character in Limerick was this huge puppet of a ghostly bride. Mm-hmm. And then I noticed so many people at the parade were dressed as ghostly brides as well, even little kids. <laughs> it was amazing. And so I thought to myself, like, oh, of course I moved to a town with a woman in white legend. It's just one, like, it would be harder to move to a town that did not have a woman (laughs) in white legend. (laughs) And obviously Limerick is really attached to theirs. Like, Mm -hmm. I'll have to look up. I'd never seen, like, kids dressed as Mm -hmm. a ghostly bride for Halloween. Like, like, just, like, dozens of them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And people in the parade. Yeah, it was wild. So, and then even in like exploring the city the next day, I noticed that ghost rides were a part of how shops and businesses decorated for the holiday. Interesting. And I feel like, um, and it seemed like it was like pre-made like party city stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. but it was all ghost rides. I was like, Mm -hmm. I didn't even know you could find this much stuff (laughs) made with like ghost rides on it. (laughs) Um, So then I took town ghost tour of course, as you should do whenever you move anywhere. Oh, absolutely. Um, (laughs) And this was the explanation I heard for Limerick's love of their woman in white legend. Mm -hmm. Long time ago, the bishop of the area took an interest in a beautiful young Limerick woman. He wooed her and they were married in secret because Catholic priests and bishops can't get married. Yep. When rumors started to swirl about the bishop's secret bride, he had her killed to protect his reputation. What a great guy. <laughs> Just Ever since, mm. she has haunted Tom and Bridge in Limerick. At mm-hmm. night, she attacks men crossing the bridge who have bad or lecherous intentions. Interesting. So horrified. So yeah, there's, yeah, there's kind of an element of like, she doesn't want anyone else to. Yeah, like, like a protective the kind of force. guy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that's the modern telling of the tale. It's pretty consistent no matter who you ask. Because, you know, I was asking people at the parade, mm-hmm. like, oh, what's that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think folks of the town enjoy this idea of having a ghostly protector looking out for them, yeah. especially given how many of them dress in costume to honor her during the Samhain parade. Yeah. No one's really sure how old this tale is. The bridge that stands there today was built in 1836. It has visible handprints on one side and people say it's where one of the bishop's lady's victims clung to the bridge to avoid falling in the river below. Whoa. Yeah. So if we assume the builders included the handprints as an homage to this famous local story, it's at least as old as 1836. Mm -hmm. However, there's been a bridge across the river leading to the castle since at least the 14th century so it's possible wow. the story is way older see i was just about to ask you like how long has there been a bridge like a bridge there right mm-hmm. um because it could be as old as that wow yeah 14th century yeah that's nuts but also pretty cool and that would also, also pretty cool yeah it's also pretty cool i think that also it, also that definitely shows like no matter what even though she was a bride so she would have been maybe in something white oh wait no she might not have been but doesn't matter because she's ancient possibly and so possibly she's definitely lost her color by this point i would think if we go off that theory yeah, yeah. um so there's like a really interesting example of how folklore changes and evolves over time that mm-hmm. I discovered in my like deep dive obsession with the Bishop's Bride. Mm-hmm. 
So there's only one written version of the tale. Oh. It's a poem from the 1860s called Drunken Thady and the Bishop's Lady. Oh. The poem is 445 lines long, so I'll probably just summarize it <laughs> if that's cool. <laughs> no, you have to say every single 445 <laughs> line. No, I'm just kidding. I would love to know your summary of it. There is a PDF link in my Instagram bio if anyone feels like reading the whole story because cool. it is it's pretty interesting, especially local history if you've ever been to Limerick. Mm -hmm. um, so the author of the poem spends a lot of those 445 lines saying that the bishop's lady was a horrible, evil person when she was alive. What and that's jerk. why she torments the city in death. He, he like cannot say enough bad things about her. She was a drunk, a gambler, an adulteress. What? There's no mention of the fact that bishops are supposed to be celibate. And yeah. So there shouldn't be a bishop's lady or a bishop's bride at all. Yeah, he we're missing the point on here. <laughs> what a terrible person she was in life and death. She's spending all her husband's money. She's picking fights with people. Oh my God. This and is there's silly. not even. Yeah, there's not even mention in the poem of like how she died or if it was like violent or mysterious at all. It's just like, no, she was terrible and she continues to be terrible. That's awful because that also like if someone is a secret bride, that's gonna affect their standing in society because it's not like you can be like, oh, my husband was out with so-and-so. You're going to be seen as like mm -hmm. a spinster by other people. And then also, like, I could totally see if there were, this is just me making shit up at this point, but I could <laughs> see people asking for her hand in marriage or something, and she's like, no, and then them getting rejected and being all butthurt about it because they didn't realize that she was married, but also someone can say no even if they're not married, just saying. But, like, I just think that, like, that's so, I don't know, I don't believe that one. I mean, I yeah. am definitely going to read it and I'm glad that you're including it, but it's <laughs> definitely like how, the, how it's changed over time is like, I like yeah. how like the point of it still prevails. Like whether, like, mm -hmm. just like you were saying where, whether she was a drunk and a gambler and had these vices in life still doesn't mean <laughs> anything about her death at all or like. Right. no one deserves that so i think that's really totally. interesting if you do read it you have to look there's my favorite part is it's really badass <laughs> the <laughs> author talks about the bishop's lady taking out a whole garrison of local soldiers like he describes people like Whoa. fighting her or like trying to like take her down oh my on god the bridge, and she just like wipes the floor with them that's so. pretty cool <laughs> Like, like, okay. <laughs> honestly like, go off queen <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because like we're looking into i say we as if i was doing it too like we're looking into this this history of it and this one guy tried to like do this like slam campaign against her like just like slandering her name and trying to make her look awful and the more he tries the more we're like wow she's amazing every <laughs> single time <laughs> yeah <laughs> i feel like this is completely off topic i'm being annoying with the whole off topic thing but that's what happened with um marie antoinette and that's also what happened with cleopatra they both had these like mm -hmm. campaigns against them and they, they are still remembered for really odd things but like the badassery comes out anyway very comes out anyway for sure mm -hmm. yeah i think that is a little bit why i think it's important to talk about like the written version versus the oral version yes is that the written version is definitely sort of like like a nasty woman slam campaign yeah <laughs> Yep. Yeah. And he, so the poem kind of makes it seem like her attacks are not targeted at individuals with bad or lecherous intention, that she just like goes for anyone going on the bridge after a certain time. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I was a little bit like, what if one of his like friends or something <laughs> <laughs> got thrown off the bridge? Because people survive. The, pr the protagonist of the poem survives her throwing him off the bridge. And that's, like, so part he got, of the okay, story. hold on. This adds a whole other layer. <laughs> so he got thrown off the bridge? He says it wasn't him. It's like the named protagonist of the story, Drunken Sure, Baby. sure, sure. sure <laughs> it's a right. friend who is not me <laughs> got thrown <laughs> off the bridge by <laughs> this ghost who supposedly only targets bad and lecherous men, but I'm not bad and lecherous. Actually, she's a horrible person. <laughs> I know. See how it falls apart? It's like, okay, sir. 
This isn't a self insert or distancing tool <laughs> or anything. Good lord. Yeah. Yeah, so that's super interesting. And obviously, we can't know if the local tale in the 1860s when he wrote it was that the Bishop's Bride was a nasty woman in right. life and death, or if that was a special take that Michael Hogan, the author of the poem, had like that was his twist on it was making her. Yeah, that a, was like, a villain. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I just think it's a really good like microcosm of what's frustrating and beautiful about folklore is mm -hmm. the oral telling from locals often varies so wildly from what people have written down. They do. They do. I think that is a perfect example of it too. That is fascinating. I was not prepared for it to be that different though. It's like, it's like, she's like this beloved entity by all of Limerick. And then there's, and then you look at the one written thing about her and it's, awful so it's really interesting <laughs> how different that is yeah yeah I was really curious sort of like where that came from or maybe even in 1860 like women reading the poem had the reaction of you or I or like honestly <laughs> we love it <laughs> and started dressing as her for Halloween yeah. even being like yeah I am terrible and adulterous and adult <laughs> can I throw men off this bridge like what of it I too have the <laughs> urge to fling lecherous people from high distances <laughs> oh my gosh that's amazing Ah, oh, sorry, my cat jumped up here. It's Kachu. Have you seen Kachu before? I have not seen Kachu. Oh before. God. Okay, hold on. I'd be honored. <laughs> he looks like so fluffy. A wise, flat-faced king. He Look, does. He also he's also kind of a perfect like supervillain cat. <laughs> oh, you know what? Somebody else told me that. I think it was like a kid I work with was like you could be like like swivel in in mm -hmm. your chair and just hold and pet him. Yeah. Oh. Yeah but he always makes he's his gorgeous. appearances. How old is he? He's only six years old, but he looks older than that just because of his facial features and how wispy white he is. Maybe mm -hmm. he's meant to be um, a women in white uh, yeah. cat familiar or so. something. Because totally. he looks like a, <laughs> he looks like a puff of white air. <laughs> well, before you go, I have a fun game we can play. CCFL edition. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Would you rather have to wear your bridal gown, which was gorgeous, by the way, I totally watched your wedding video like a normal person, <laughs> or a fantasy core outfit of your choosing for the rest of your afterlife? That's a difficult choice. Mm -hmm. As pretty and elvish as my wedding dress was, mm -hmm. I'm not mean enough to be a woman in white ghost. <laughs> I like to think anyway. <laughs> And also, if I wear a fantasy core outfit, I think it would be a really funny dichotomy because people would think I'm a much older ghost in like medieval quest inspired clothing. Oh my God. And then I could just say a bunch of like modern slang and really confuse them. Oh my God. They could be like wandering and they'd see you and be like, oh, hello, fair maid. And you'd be like, Soleil Queen, I love your backpack or whatever. <laughs> the vibes here are off. <laughs> That would be the best. Oh my god, I want a sitcom of that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. I I second your decision to do that. Amazing. What Irish creature would you most want to meet now that you live in Ireland? Definitely selkies. I yes. love beaches and water and seals. Yeah. I like to think I could reassure them that I would never ever steal their skin or take yes. their agency away and yeah. we would have great underwater adventures. I love that because um man, I, I also won't shut up about the freaking uh mermaid episode. I d go it, over it's mermaid. It's, it's, it's not mermaid. your fault. <laughs> I mean, I guess when this comes out it'll be June, but we can still celebrate mermaid anyway <laughs> in the next month. But it's just funny because like I there was one, of course I don't remember which one where if they held your hand you could breathe underwater i'm almost positive it was selkies and like if you held their flipper underwater then they would help you breathe and then vice versa like obviously if you steal their pelt that would be a horrible thing to do but like mm -hmm. having their pelt is, or taking their pelt off you could be like land friends and underwater friends i think that's really mm -hmm. fun right. and so for the last one if you were able to catch a leprechaun and make a wish what would you wish for 
oh okay leprechauns are have like a really tricksy reputation i think i trust a wish from them like even less than a genie (laughs) (laughs) which is saying something (laughs) I feel like I would just ask them to tell me about themselves. <laughs> okay. And yeah. And maybe tell me a little bit about their folklore. There's an yeah. interesting sort of going back to what we were talking about of ways to like hide and subvert paganism as Christianity uh-huh. was gaining control of. They uh-huh. are thought by some people to be like agents of the sun god Lu. <gasps> oh. Like that's where the la part of oh, their name comes from. Interesting. So I feel like I'd ask them if that was true and like... Just See if they were connected. That would be my wish is be like, tell me about yourself. Please don't <laughs> curse me. And also, I just want to get to know you. <laughs> that was really smart because I was being a bit like a leprechaun and I was trying to get you to wish for something and be like, well, actually, they'll trick you, Heather. But I should have known that a fake queen such as yourself would mm-hmm. never fall for such a trick. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, thank you for humoring me. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Heather. I'm going to include Heather's information in the show notes below, but why don't you let us know more about where people can find you? I'm on TikTok and Instagram at heather.wildflower. I've got a weekly folklore series on both platforms called Heather's Hearth. And if you like this podcast, I think it would be right up your alley. Oh, absolutely. I'm pretty sure the spooky soul crossover is very high because as soon as you see Heather's content, you're going to love it. You're really going to love it. (laughs) I love it so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks. You too. We'll have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks to all you spooky souls out there for listening to Creepy Core and Folklore. Follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok if you're looking for more uncanny content. If you have your own tales to tell, you can email creepycore and folklore at gmail.com. If you liked this, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts or tell a friend who might enjoy these stories to spread the word. If you're interested in dark fantasy, check out my Hollowverse series. Ashes is available now in paperback and ebook on Amazon and audiobook on Audible, and the sequel is underway. I'm Iona Wayland, and I'll see you next time.